forgot what that is now. Dr. Mauer, he's been on the uh, University of Maryland Fire Protection Engineering Department since 1987. He has a Bachelor of Science degree from the Illinois Institute of Technology in Fire Protection and Safety Engineering, which that school doesn't have a, that program anymore, but since then he's, he also went on and got his Master of Science and PhD in Fire Protection at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, as we mentioned, he's been on the board of directors uh, for the SFPE National since 1995 and uh, was most recently president of the, the National Group last year. So with that, I'd like to give Dr. Mauer. Uh, it's good to be back. We had a good time here uh, last year at the, uh, the National Conference. Of course, we did uh, have the SFPE annual meeting at the time of the NFPA, and I know some people have been disappointed that we're not continuing to do that. I can assure you that wasn't our choice. Uh, NFPA has taken to filling up the Sunday slot with other activities, and we basically needed to find another time to hold our annual meeting, and we thought that the Professional Development Week would be a good opportunity to join those. A lot of people will be coming in for Professional Development Week so we're having our annual meeting and banquet on the first day of that, and I would encourage you to attend if, you, if you're able to. Um, it won't always be in Baltimore. The plan is to move it around. We have had a spring PDW week in Las Vegas this year, and the idea is to move this around the country. I know that there are some people who feel like SFPE has a real strong East Coast slant to it, and uh, I won't deny that there are a lot of people, obviously the University of Maryland is, and WPI are the only two institutions producing degrees right now. And as a consequence, there is a, an East Coast bias. And it's moved, it's shifted. You know, when, when uh, some of us went through the IIT program, the highest concentration of fire protection engineers was in the Midwest. But there's no question that that has shifted. <clears throat> and we're trying to work and, and encourage people to get uh, to move to other areas, and I know it's been difficult uh, to get people from the East Coast to stay in the Midwest. So what we need for you to do, and I would encourage you to help identify local students to attend these programs. There are now going to be a couple of distance education programs. There's the ongoing program at WPI. We're starting one in Maryland where you can get a master's degree through distance education. And I think that's going to be a good way for you to identify local people who are interested in living in this area and send them off to school, virtually speaking, so that they will stay here. So uh, I know that there, most of us have very strong roots where we grew up, and, and that's true of our students as well. They kind of, they come out and go different places, but three or four years later, they want to come back home for one reason or another. And that's even more difficult for employers because they put all the cost into training these students or these employers, or employees, and then they leave. Um, let's see, if you like the presentation tonight, I'll take all the credit. <laughs> if you don't like it, lay out, because I gave him a choice of two or three topics, and this is the one he chose. <laughs> 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 but I put you on the spot early on. Um, you know, th this is a, uh, uh, I, I do a fair amount of forensic work on, on the side. I have for many years. The first case I was involved in was the MGM Grand Fire way back in 1980. It's a heck of a fire to cut your teeth on. Um, but in, in fact, that's one of the case studies that I'm going to talk about certain aspects. So what I want to do is talk about, I call this beyond cause and origin. Uh, I've noticed in, in the forensic field an awful lot of focus is on what started the fire, right? What was the cause of the fire? And what I like to say, it isn't really the cause of fire, it's the cause of ignition. Because when you look at the cause of the fire, it's all the chain of events that takes place. And usually, if you have a serious fire, there are some aspects of the fire protection systems that should have been or could have been designed in the building that haven't functioned properly. So I like to think of the cause of the fire as all the contributing factors that contribute to the outcome. And obviously, we're primarily interested in the forensic field in major disasters, right? Those are studied a lot more intently than our successes simply because there's a lot more money lost and that there's a lot more people trying to recover some of the money that has been lost. 
Um, there needs to be a lot of focus on fire investigation, on the cause and origin of a fire. We need to know what started the fire. Maybe we can improve our codes and standards as a result of that. Obviously, there's an interest in potential causes of action against responsible parties if there's been some kind of negligence or some kind of product defect. I think the real basis for this is, you know, the public officials, when they go out, they're primarily interested in whether the fire was intentionally set. And really, that's their mandate, typically, simply to determine if there was arson. And if there was, there's going to be an interest in criminal prosecution of the perpetrators. Uh, on the civil side, there might be interest in denying insurance coverage. Right? If somebody starts their own business or house on fire, um, clearly the insurance can be denied for that. I've noticed, and I don't know this is a fact, but, but certainly I'm hearing more talk about bad faith. Right? Insurance companies have to be very careful about denying coverage because if they do it and there's a bad faith action, uh, then they can get in big trouble, although I've been told in Minnesota that's not such uh, so true. I really think the focus on cause and origin, I know some of the cause and origin investigators like to say it's origin and cause, but traditionally it's been called cause and origin, and I think a lot of this focus carries over to public perceptions, right? Whenever we watch a big fire on TV, right, what does the newscaster say? Well, the cause of the fire was a cigarette or a match, kids playing with matches. And you're, you're looking at this raging fire. It's in a building, it's pouring out the windows, it's in the wildland, it's, you know, it's raging over acres. And of course, everybody's interested in finding out that, that little kernel that started this thing, rather than worrying about all the factors that contributed to this small fire getting large. So what I want to do this evening is talk about some of the engineering aspects of building fires by looking at uh, a number of case studies. Um, you know, one of the things that I've always liked, as long as I've been doing this, or close to that long, the American Society of Civil Engineers has a technical committee on forensic investigations. And they provided a definition in their document that they produced that said, a failure is an unacceptable difference between expected and observed performance. And I like that. I mean, it's a, it's a performance-based standard. It's qualitative. It doesn't pin anything down exactly. But I think it's important. We're the engineers. We're the people who know what kind of performance is expected of the systems we put into buildings. And therefore, we're the best, we should, we're the best position to judge whether or not our systems perform as expected when we make those observations. And quite frankly, a lot of the cause and origin investigators don't have that understanding of the codes and standards. They don't know what kind of fire protection systems should have been in place. And this is not true of all of them, but by and large, it's the fire protection engineers who understand that context. Similarly, on some of these fires, you work with some very high level fire scientists. But many of those also understand the dynamics of fires, but they don't really understand what should have been in place to change the outcome. And so I really think that fire protection engineers, if you have a major fire, if you're investigating a major fire, you really need a fire protection engineer to provide that kind of perspective. And I'm not just saying that because I'm a professor of fire protection engineering and the former president of the Society of Fire Protection Engineers. I'll make that. <laughs> um, preliminary considerations, many of the fire safety standards that we have, you know, if you look at the NFPA 16 volume set of codes and standards, it describes the materials, practices, and procedures intended to prevent the ignition of fire. Building codes, on the other hand, generally describe the fire safety systems and features that should be in place to mitigate the consequences of fires that do occur. If we didn't expect to have fires, there'd be no need for sprinklers, there'd be no need for detectors and alarms, there'd be no need for egress systems. But we anticipate that we're going to have fires. Some of these fires are intentionally set. And simply because they're intentionally set doesn't mean that we should have a building burn now. Right? Our system should be in place. And I've done a lot of work, for instance, on, on college housing. I've written a report on, camp, on college housing and uh, we studied the causes of college housing, and at least 25% of college housing fires are caused by arson. Now, we can't ignore that and say, well, it's arson, it's criminal. 
what throw up our hands and say we can't do anything about it. Otherwise, we're neglecting 25% of the fires that are occurring in college housing. What we need to do is say we need to design the systems in, and certainly we prosecute those people. We don't condone that kind of activity, but if we ignore it, we're ignoring a large fraction of the fires that are occurring, and we simply can't do that and expect to save uh, the lives of students. Um, so what I tend to focus on when I do these forensic studies is I look at a number of factors that have permitted a small fire to grow large. Uh, flammability of materials is paramount. We saw that on February 20th at the station. Right? When, you, when you line the walls and ceiling with flexible polyurethane foam, you have a fire that becomes catastrophic in a hurry. Right? That was a very small place. The fact that that many people couldn't get out of that building speaks to how quickly that fire spread. And that kind of performance is completely unacceptable. Uh, and it's prohibited. And it, and it needs to be recognized that it's prohibited. Uh, a lot of cases you're dealing with not only flammability of materials, but you have a failure to detect, to notify either occupants or the fire department. You may have a failure to suppress a fire automatically or manually or to contain it through fire-resistant construction. Uh, some of the reasons why these might occur is because you have a failure to train people, either employees or contractors, with respect to these issues. And so related to that is you have to ask the question, what barriers to fire growth were either missing, or substandard, or were otherwise defective if you're going to get to the heart of uh, this issue? All right, what really got me started on this, and I, I don't want to take uh, a lot of time, I know there's a lot of text there. Uh, there was actually a landmark case that just went to the Iowa Supreme Court recently involving a fire in a warehouser, uh, warehouse. Am I saying that? If you're having a few drinks. Uh, right, a warehouser, warehouse in Iowa uh, where they stored roll paper storage. And there was a new employee who hadn't been trained yet who was being trained basically on the job training, right? He was put on this forklift, he was driving it around the plant. It ran out of gas, he and his supervisor replaced the LP cylinder on the, uh, on the forklift. He started driving around again, his supervisor wasn't paying close attention, he's off doing something else. A few minutes later, the guy driving the forklift smells smoke, there's white smoke coming out of the engine compartment. He, he goes to tell the supervisor, and they discovered later that he forgot to disengage the parking brake when he started driving again. Clearly, there's some contribution there to what happened with respect to that fire. Well, these guys ran, uh, were trying to go back and fight this fire and was starting to engulf the LP cylinder, which sits up behind the seat on this forklift. And they see that the fire's engulfing the forklift they uh, they decided to leave, and it's a good thing they did. Because about 45 seconds later, the LP cylinder exploded. It lifted the building, broke the sprinkler piping, and of course now you had a major fire in a roll paper storage facility. And I think it was three or four days later that they put it out. Well, well, what happened at the time? So by the way, uh, you know what I'm going to do is kind of intersperse some of the operational issues with some of the technical issues. <laughs> if you were involved in the investigation of fires, by the way, oh, this screen is great. We're not clear that this will be as fabulous, but the point is, this is what an LP, this is what an LP cylinder looks like. You know, I've given this presentation before, and I mean, I can see that just perfectly. <laughs> Anyways, this is what an LP cylinder looks like if it's if it hasn't performed properly. <laughs> this is evidence that this thing is blown up. I've been involved in probably four or five fires where you find aluminum LP cylinders that have exploded. Gas cylinders are not supposed to explode in a fire. There's a safety relief vent on them, and it's supposed to relieve the pressure gracefully. You're going to have a big fire when you relieve 43 pounds of propane, but it's supposed to relieve without blowing up. And this, in this case, uh, this cylinder didn't do that. And in fact, you know, the, the, uh, there's a federal regulation, 49 CFR 173.34D, but you all knew that. 
which requires that you basically are supposed to take one of these tanks and subject it to a bonfire test. You, you build a big wood crib fire, you suspend one of these tanks in the middle of the fire, and it's not supposed to blow up when exposed for at least 15 minutes. So this requirement demonstrates that it's anticipated that LP tanks may be exposed to fire. Now, you can pretty well tell by political persuasion, you know, there's a bunch of people sitting here saying, well, this idiot drove around with the parking brake engaged. That's the reason why this fire happened. That's the cause of the whole thing. But the Supreme Court of Iowa disagrees with that. That was allowed at the original trial. The reason this went to the Supreme Court of Iowa is that the plaintiffs, in this case, the insurance interests of Weyerhaeuser, basically said, you know, this tank must have been defective. Because it blew up, it must have been defective. It doesn't really matter how this fire started. Now, the, the original judge allowed testimony about the contributory negligence of the driver and Weyerhaeuser for not training and all that into the trial. And the jury assigned some blame, uh, assigned some responsibility to Weyerhaeuser because of that. And, and they argued that they shouldn't have, that in fact this was just a product defect and that that was the cause. Sure enough, the Iowa Supreme Court, I shouldn't say sure enough, it's always a crapshoot, but in this particular case, the Supreme Court of Iowa came back with this ruling. If a defendant has a duty to foresee a particular type of harmful force, such as a fire, and guard others against the harm that the force can do, and the defendant fails in this duty, the cause of the fire is irrelevant to the liability of the defendant. I mean, quite frankly, I mean, I, I'm an engineer. I thought about becoming a lawyer, and I thank my lucky stars every day I made the decision I did. Uh, I deal with them enough in these forensic cases, but um, th this has incredible ramifications. It really says that a lot of times the cause and origin doesn't matter. It really says if you're going to apply flammable polyurethane foam to the walls and ceiling of a facility, it doesn't really matter how that fire started, that you're supposed to anticipate that. And I can think of a lot of other examples, and if you really think about it, all the fire protection systems we install in a building anticipate that a fire is going to occur. And so you may not be able to say, well, you know, somebody else caused the fire. If you were supposed to have a system in there that was supposed to do something to minimize the consequences of the fire, this kind of a ruling may put you on the spot uh, with respect to that. I would like to take a few minutes and talk about the technical issues. Aluminum, and again, some of you, if you're dealing in the industrial environment, you're going to run into this. Aluminum cylinders fail at lower temperatures than steel cylinders. They have lower strength, and they lose their strength more rapidly with temperature. Um, I will tell you that I have not been able to find any records that actually demonstrate that aluminum cylinders were ever tested according to the CFR as they were supposed to be. I really think if you go back to the early 1970s when aluminum cylinders started to be used to replace aluminum, I think they just took all the gadgets off the steel cylinder and put them on the aluminum cylinder. And I haven't seen any evidence that anybody's actually tested that. But I do want you to know it's a problem. I've seen it, you know, I, don't, I don't do all that many fire investigations, but I've seen it in four or five different cases. A lot of times it's not really causative. In one case, uh, a million square foot warehouse, there's an aluminum cylinder literally sitting as far away from the start of the fire as you can get. Had absolutely no, made no difference to the outcome, but the fact that the aluminum cylinder blew up instead of venting gracefully indicates that this is a pretty widespread problem. Uh, in this particular case, I think that cylinder may have been overfilled. Right? You don't maintain the, ga the gas space. If you overfill with liquid, then as this tries to expand with increasing temperature, the pressure just goes right through the roof. Uh, on the other hand, the pressure relief device still should have operated, and there still would have been a defect, even if that was the case. Question? Yeah, the one agent investigated that they found out it was properly threaded. So, so yeah, yeah, right. Communicate on paper. Right? Yeah, right, right. One of the questions, I mean, you can, in fact, get these things turned upside down where you're not in contact with the vapor space with pressure relief. But, yeah, these things typically have a hole and a lock pin where 
And all of that was checked out. There wasn't any evidence that any of that happened. Um, from a technical standpoint, here's really what's going on, the difference between steel and aluminum. Um, this is the strength of steel as a function of temperature. This is the strength of aluminum. So you can see how it's got a lower strength to begin with, and it starts to lose strength at a much lower temperature <coughs> than steel does. Um, for the thicknesses of steel and aluminum that are used in these tanks, if you look at the pressure that would be exerted when the pressure relief device is supposed to be operating, you would have a stress of, in the steel of 198 megapascals, right here about 200, and you would reach that strength threshold at just about 600 degrees centigrade. Paul, help me out, what is that Fahrenheit? 600 degrees Fahrenheit, centigrade, about 1,300 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, like you said, it's about 1,100 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> <laughs> Good chance. Um, all right, and the, and, and the other extreme, uh, the aluminum tank is going to fail at about 102 megapascals, and don't ask me to convert that to PSI, but in any case, it's a pressure reading, it's a stress level. The point is, the aluminum cylinder is likely to fail at about 300 degrees centigrade, and in fact, it's going to be much more likely to be achieved before the tank can completely vent than it will be in a steel tank to reach 600. So that provides a little bit of the material science aspect. Yeah. You know the uh, rated fill density is for propane tanks? I you think it's about, your mind? I, well, I think offhand, I, I, they're typically filled to about 60 or 70 percent. Is it yeah, 80? Is it 80? That's going to make a big difference. You have thermal expansion of that yeah. propane liquid fill, and that's when you get your spike. Well, you can. You can, but in fact, it's anticipated, you know, that shouldn't be going on. But even if you do, that pressure should be able to relieve through the safety relief device that's operating properly. All right, the other thing that we do in the, in the case like this is simulate, you know, what I'm trying to show here is the idea that you, you take a tank and you immerse it in a flame. And for instance, in a forklift, a lot of times the fire's coming up through a vent from the engine compartment. You don't fully immerse the tank. But, you know, we've developed models where you can kind of play with what fraction of the tank is immersed, how emissive is the fire, how hot is the fire. And you kind of go through this exercise. What typically happens in these tanks, this line is intended to indicate a fill line. A lot of times what you'll see is, is there's a failure somewhere on the top of the tank because the flame in contact with the liquid, there's a lot more heat capacity, but it's the flame in contact or radiating to the gas space where this part of the aluminum can heat up much more quickly. It starts to thin. That's where it fails and it goes. And here's an example. This can happen pretty quickly, right? For some of these parameters, we don't need to worry about the details. But if this is going to fail at about 300 degrees C, you know, for this particular calculation, it's somewhere between one and two minutes. So this 45 seconds is not out of range. And, and this type of problem can happen pretty quickly. Um, so from a technical standpoint, this is an interesting problem. For those of you dealing in industrial environments, uh, quite frankly, I don't know what the solution to this is. It's really hard. The reason why they went to aluminum in the first place is that for a 33 and a half or a 43 and a half pound tank, the tanks weigh about 10 pounds less, right? So to save somebody's back from picking up that extra 10 pounds, you know, one of the thoughts I have is that they should put like caskets on the back of these things where you, you kind of encapsulate these cylinders if you're going to use aluminum to shield them from a potential fire. Um, but I did think that case got me to thinking that there's a lot of interesting aspects with respect to looking beyond cause and origin. And in fact, a lot of the fires I'm going to talk about now, there's, there's a, none of them were ever proven to be arson, but certainly there's a strong suspicion of arson. So. Another case I had is North Central High School, which uh, is the, I don't know if it still is, but at the time it was the largest high school in the state of Indiana, right? Now what's Indiana known for? Hoosiers, Hoosiers, right? Basketball, right? Basketball is to Indiana as football is to Texas. And so you had a very large high school gymnasium here. And it's not unlike the high school I went to uh, outside of Chicago. You, you know, you had 
You had the floor. This is up on the balcony. Uh, you know, when you're not having a sporting event, you've got the bleachers retracted, and then they pull out to the balcony and they look down on the main floor down below. In this particular case, there was a stack. We've kind of recreated this. There was a stack of uh, gymnastics mats, right, made out of flexible polyurethane foam covered with vinyl and nylon. What I'm not showing here is there was also a floor exercise mat, which was about 40 feet square, right, for tumbling exercises. And uh, that was actually made of a nylon carpet material that was was over about a two inch thick slab of polyethylene foam. All right, so this is kind of, you know, this is kind of the after the fire and this is what we recreated afterward. Couple of issues here. The flammability of the athletic mats was important. Uh, we also looked at the flammability of the bleachers. These particular bleachers you can see are plastic. They're a structural foam plastic material. It's different. Traditional bleachers were made out of wood, metal, etc. And so I know we've got a lot of people in the sprinkler industry here. You can see sprinklers up here. Uh, they were installed at the time of the fire, but the system was not yet in operation. Uh, so they weren't very effective. But I do have a question for you. What would be the design basis for this space? Ordinary tube. Ordinary tube? NFPA 13 says light hazard for a gymnasium. Okay, well, I want you to appreciate you basically have a six foot deep, 18 foot tall stack of a group A plastic sitting here, right? And it's got all of these convoluted shielded surfaces, right? So it's more than four feet wide, it's got all these shielded surfaces. And it's a group A plastic. So, question, you know, I, I'm not sure what the answer is. Uh, the fact that it's restricted just against the wall, maybe that's, uh, maybe light has to be, be good enough. You said you've got an ordinary group too? Okay. Um, all right, well, let, let, let me stay on that. Some, some of these text slides, uh, you know, when I hand this out, it makes a difference. Long and short of it is a stack of, uh, Mats was observed to be on fire. There were three workers who came down this hallway and kind of simultaneously arrived here. They ran around, they found some extinguishers. They tried to pick up one of the mats and squirt it and uh, just made the fire worse. Um, the fire seems to have spread against the, uh, across the floor exercise mat, which interestingly enough, doesn't pass the pill test, which is required of floor covering materials. Uh, but the fire spread over the bleachers, it went up the bleachers, and took the roof off of this part of the building. It vented itself, and it didn't cause too much damage throughout the rest of the building, but that was a uh, significant aspect. So, uh, again, the other interesting part, if you do any of this kind of forensic analysis, you have three eyewitnesses who saw the exact same thing at the exact same time, and gave three completely different accounts for what had happened that day. So one of the reasons why we do the analysis and do modeling is to try to figure out which of the accounts seems to make the most sense. The issues here were the flammability characteristics of the gym mats. I do want to caution you. I've, I've been involved in about four different fires involving gym mats. The first one was in the early 1980s, right here in Fridley, Minnesota. A couple kids went up on the balcony of the gym. They wanted to start a little smoke to get out of school early. And uh, that's where the pole vault pit and the high jump pit were both being stored during the off season. The pole vault pit has about 800 pounds of foam in it. The high jump pit has about 400 pounds of foam in it. So you have more than half a ton of polyurethane foam sitting there in two stacks, one six foot high, one nine foot high makes for an interesting, it generated plenty of smoke for it. Um, from a product standpoint, you have ease of ignition, issues, rate of fire growth, heat release rate, smoke production. There was also issues with respect to the flammability characteristics of the bleachers. Again, interestingly enough, these are actually a foam plastic material, and there are special 
provisions related to foam plastics that don't would not normally be applied to this, partly due to a recognition. All right, so how do we look at this? Well, one of the ways I look at this, I say the Life Safety Code has a provision, and has, I think, since 1976 or even earlier. Furnishings or decorations of an explosive or highly flammable character shall not be used. Here's a nice performance specification for you. Uh, what constitutes highly flammable? Well, they don't really define it, but they do say a Christmas tree not effectively flame retardant treated might be classified as highly flammable. All right, Al, now's when I need your help. I want to turn on this, switch this over. I can see I might be able to do it myself. I'll get this one. Okay. All right, so here's a Christmas tree. It's actually at the University of California, Berkeley. It, it doesn't show it, but it's underneath the hood. That's Professor Williamson. And uh, he's just trying to get this thing started. This was actually similar to a tree. This is a pretty large tree. This is like a 12-foot tree, a 10-foot tree. It had flocking on it, right? Any of you familiar with flocking materials? I don't think they're as popular as they used to be. I know when I was a kid, my grandmother had it. Right? It was an old German tradition. It kind of looked like it was snow on the branches. And, uh, you know, you look at this, and you wonder if we shouldn't get the flock out of here. <laughs> the, uh, in any case, what we're actually doing here is we're capturing the products of combustion in the hood, measuring the oxygen concentration and the flow rate of gases in the hood. And from that, we can calculate the heat release rate of this Christmas tree as a function of time. Now the value of that is we take that data and we plug it into a fire model so that we can take this Christmas tree and stick it in the living room and see what kind of conditions result from this Christmas tree burning. Again, it's one of those ironies is you're allowed to have a Christmas tree like this in your home where it's pretty well assured to cause flashover uh, in your home, but you couldn't put that same tree over in the corner of this room where it would just cause a little bit of heating, right? And, and probably the hazard wouldn't be as severe if we put that into a large space like a ballroom, yet we don't allow trees like that in ballrooms because of all the people involved, but we do allow it in the home environment where uh, the hazard associated with that is gonna be a lot worse. So but for those of you who maybe don't deal with the modeling and those aspects, the heat release rate, all right, this gives us a kind of a calibration of what would constitute an extremely flammable product according to the life safety model. Yeah. In this particular demonstration, it wasn't the alleged fire retardant flock. No, that's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't worse. But you know, it, I look at that in a this, this test was run in 1989, and back then, when we were all young and naive, I was impressed. I thought this was a pretty good fire. But I've got another one for you. Well, the only reason I bring that up is I have a manufacturing plant in the city of Minneapolis, and it is allegedly fire retardant. And I have had two fires in it, and they will burn. Yeah, they're not tired. And they'll burn this like that. Right. And actually, quite honestly, I would consider that to be real severe burn. I mean, that kind of grew and went up and went down. In comparison, don't close your eyes. All right, here's, here's a test that was run at NIST. Isolation, you don't get the full impact. All right, so they started this just with like an electric match. Oh, jeez. Oh, oh, <coughs> it's funny to throw a Okay. So I guess this would clearly constitute an extremely flammable material. All right, and 
see the Energizer Bunny there in the foreground on the left. Bye-bye. The bunny goes, it's time to get out. So that can be compared to the station fire, sort of. Yeah, this is even faster than that. It's, it's pretty significant. In any case, this kind of gives us some basis for saying, you know, what constitutes Uh, so that kind of gives us a basis for saying what constitutes an extremely flammable or highly flammable furnishing or decoration. Uh, there is another requirement in the life safety code that's fairly recent. I don't know exactly when it was first introduced, but within the last few editions. And it basically says that furnishings and contents made with foam plastic materials that are unprotected from ignition will have a heat release rate not exceeding 100 kilowatts when tested in accordance with UL 1975, standard for fire tests for foam plastics used for decorative purposes. Now, why UL had to put that last used for decorative purposes on there is beyond me. Why not just say standard for fire tests for foam plastics? Um, and in fact, I, I got deposed in this case involving the North Central High School, and the attorney got kind of cute when I said that this provision would give us a basis for just determining whether this was a safe product or not. And he said, well, were these athletic mats being used for decorative purposes? And I said, at the time of the fire, they weren't being used for athletic purposes. So yes, they were being used for <laughs> Why else would they be there? Um, all right, so, yeah. size fire 100 kilowatts. Yeah, I was, I was just going to do that. Let, let me get this video queued up and then we'll talk a little bit about that. Who wants yours or yours? Uh, they settled. As, as I was telling Robert earlier, right? Some clients write the check, some clients cash the check. In this case, my client cash the check. Um, but it doesn't always work out that way. All right, so Al has asked, and I'm glad he did, um, what is the size of a fire? All right, so here I've just, uh, th this, by the way, let me set this up and then we'll talk about that. This is actually, there was a foam uh, a mattress fire, factory fire in Mobile, Alabama back in the early 80s. I got involved in, quite honestly, it's like, what the heck does a mattress manufacturer have suing the phone manufacturer. <laughs> That's the pot calling the kettle black, right? Uh, but in any case, here is 650 pounds of polyurethane foam. Uh, this is non-fire retardant polyurethane foam. Uh, I haven't been invited back to Mobile. Um, there's still some, if you go to their training center, you'll still see the small marks between these stacks that uh, that we left, but basically had four stacks, five feet high. Two of them were in L-shaped configuration. Uh, that one on the right was separated by a three-foot aisle from the L, and then the one that just lit off on the left is actually six feet over. And this thing just, uh, I guess it's safe to say all hell broke loose. Uh, again, I want you to appreciate this is about 650 pounds of polyurethane foam. A high jump pit has 800 pounds of foam. No, I'm sorry, a pole vault pit has 800 pounds of foam. A high jump pit has 400 pounds of foam. So if you stack those two things side by side, you end up with about 1,200 pounds of foam. To give you a sense of scale now, if, if you look at how much energy there is in 650 pounds of polyurethane, and this is going to burn out in about three minutes. If we assume that the fire grows linearly to a peak and then back down, we have a triangle. The peak heat release rate of this fire would be about 100 megawatts. Okay? Whereas we're talking about a maximum permitted of 100 kilowatts, so there's a factor of a thousand. This fire is a thousand times bigger 
than what the code say would be acceptable for a foam plastic product. A hundred kilowatt fire is that if you have like a waste basket burning, it would be above this bulb. Yay by yay. So 100 kilowatts, in and of itself, 100 kilowatt fire is not dangerous. On the other hand, it does present the risk that it's going to ignite other products that will be a hazard. Where was this Mobile? Well, the, the mattress factory was in Mobile, but again, I, I've used this with respect to, I've, I've had a number of different athletic mat fires, the North Central one, the Fridley one. The worst one was in Worcester, I think it was in Worcester, Massachusetts. In this case, the athletic mats were being stored in an outbuild, a field house by the football field, the front half of which was the concession stand for the football games. And these kids, the, the garage half of this was locked up. These kids would break into the concession stand, climb up over the chain link fence, and go down and lay on these mats and uh, smoke cigarettes. And then they'd start to flip lit matches at each other. And they caught the archery equipment and these mats on fire. They tried to put it out, they couldn't put it out. By the time they realized that they needed to get out of there, their only means of escape was to climb back up over this chain link fence, right up at the ceiling, and they all got burned. And uh, it was a very nasty uh, situation. In any case, um, All right, now let me give you the doomsday scenario. And that is, now I want you to book it. All right, I'll give it a pass. Good. All right, now I, want you, now I want to go back to the doomsday scenario. On the left, you've got the bleachers retracted. I want you to imagine all the athletic mats being out there for use by the gymnastics team and the wrestling team when there's not a sports event. What do you do with those mats when you want to pull the bleachers up? The bleachers. That's right. You pull part of the bleachers up, you jam all these athletic mats underneath the bleachers. Then you fill the bleachers up with a thousand people and you can't get underneath it, right? You can't get under there. You got some kids dropping matches down through the bleachers, maybe. I mean, there's a thousand people, there's a good chance they couldn't do it. I haven't heard of this scenario yet. It's starting to sound a little bit like the Bradford Stadium fire though, in England where they had a bunch of debris accumulate under the bleachers and everybody's watching the soccer game, ignoring the fire. And sure enough, this thing goes to flash over. But I want you to think about something else. How do you sprinkler under the bleachers? Right now, we've got a room within a room. When those bleachers are pulled out, you've got a shield. Whatever's going on under there, you've got a shielded fire. And I want, I'm, in all seriousness, I want you to think about how you protect that. And the fact is, I don't think we think about that when we design sprinkler systems, but that would fit the definition of a shielded fire, whether the athletic mats are under there or not. And don't forget there are motors on these things. You can have a motor malfunction and made out of foam plastic. Again, just give you some food for thought, regardless of the life safety. But I do see, for those of you who are regulating um, gymnasiums, high, every high school, every gymnasium, you gotta pay attention. I mean, the, the, the wrestling mats get rolled up and stuffed in different places, and in that rolled configuration, they burn like crazy. And uh, I know I, I actually, after the station fire, I was contacted by a manufacturer who makes the wall pads that are used to prevent kids from crashing into the brick walls. And you know, those are another type of foam plastic that really needs to be looked at and regulated. You know, I'll be honest with you, I'm not terribly concerned about that because in a gymnasium, you've got about a 25 to 40 foot ceiling, and these things are only put up to about six feet. And so I'm not concerned. Certainly, I wouldn't want that stuff lining the entire walls and ceiling. And so, 
But, but this scenario where the athletic nets might get shoved underneath the bleachers during a sporting event is one that I would pay particular attention to uh, from an enforcement standpoint. Okay. Uh, that's my public, those are my two public service announcements. Right? Watch out for aluminum cylinders, watch out for athletic nets. Right? Those are two nasty uh, actors. Yeah. So, um, did, have you done anything with the mats when they're using their um, athletic layout? You know, they're playing all over the floor. Is it only a problem in their stack? Um, well, in fact, the, the floor exercise mat, if you look at the life safety code, it actually says that that those types of mats should be regulated by the fill test, which is ridiculously small. And the fact that this product couldn't even pass the fill test tells you how bad it is. It is a problem, it's a hazard that's greater than we anticipate by the code. Right? So when you look at what's the expectation of a floor covering, it should perform better than these floor exercise mats do. Uh, I do think the hazard is clearly much more severe as you start to roll this up and stack it up and it's more of a concern. But again, I look at this field house fire, and that's getting close to doing the right thing. That's putting this stuff under lock and key in an unoccupied building, and even then, you know, under some circumstances, you can have a problem. But, but realistically, I know that high school now, I believe, is taking all this stuff and putting it in a locked room. But if you think about it, that run, you've got a risk in that too. Because if now I take all my athletic mats and I pile them into a single room, if anybody does get into that room and start a fire, I've got a huge fire. So it, it's a very difficult situation. What I would really like to see is the manufacturers of these mats put a little engineering into them. Right? If you look at other products, for instance, uh, California Technical Bulletin 133, Right? Now we make upholstered furniture for public occupancies that can't burn vigorously. And they typically do that by putting an inner layer between the foam and the fabric. So I think that with technology, this could be vastly improved. But the hazard associated with these athletic mats is far greater than upholstered furniture because you have 600 pounds of foam instead of 20 pounds of foam. Um, all right, this next case was kind of an interesting one. Again, this is a little bit old. This is an apartment building in Silver Spring, Maryland. And the scenario here, as you can see, we have a double loaded corridor. We have a bank of elevators here. We have a couple of exit stairs. All right, so it's a pretty standard building. There was a fire that started in the elevator lobby in an upholstered bench um, at about 5.30 in the evening. Again, probably you know, let, let me just say, suspicious origin, right? These things don't just spontaneously erupt. Um, the people on the fire floor, on the eighth floor, none of them could escape because of the smoke. So they all just stayed in their apartments, went out on their balconies, and waited it out. The fire department showed up, the fire burned out, you know, they ventilated it, none of those people got injured. There was a uh, three people, there was actually four people in an apartment up on the top floor, the 16th floor. Uh, the father was cooking dinner, the grandfather, the mother, and the daughter all evacuated. The three of them walked out, they heard the fire alarm, they went out, they went down two flights of stairs, right? this, is, this is like a 90-year-old grandfather, 70-year-old woman, and 40-year-old woman. They go down two flights of stairs. They say the smoke was too heavy. They couldn't go down the stairs any further. They go over to the elevators. They call the elevators. The elevators respond. An elevator responds. They get in, push the ground floor. The elevator goes down to the eighth floor, opens up, and it's not very hot. A lot of smoke. Dense black smoke. And it, they all dropped, uh, actually, amazingly, the, the mother, the 70-year-old and the 90-year-old, crawled over to the nearest apartment and were taken in by the occupants. So they got out of the smoke environment. The daughter, the granddaughter, who was the 40-year-old, was found in the elevator. And of course, once those doors open, they won't reclose because of the, the, the smoke blocks the, uh, the light. And so you can't get them to reclose. Now, this is an interesting case on a number of levels. We'll talk a little bit about the flammability, but 
I want you to think about the elevator operation. Right? We, we actually send some mixed messages in this field. These were old elevators. They didn't get captured. Modern elevators all get captured and recalled. The granddaughter actually worked for the federal government in a high-rise office building, and she had been trained that elevators get captured and recalled in the event of a fire. Now, you can say, well, gee, she knew there was a fire. She knew she shouldn't have used them. But on the other hand, you know, there's a certain logic to the notion that if you, if you call an elevator and it responds, it should be safe to use. Right? Because if they're not safe to use, they're going to be captured and recalled. Well, in this case, in, in this building, this was an old elevator system and it hadn't been updated. In fact, the elevator company was sued and they prevailed at court because they had offered to upgrade the system and the condo association had turned down that offer repeatedly. So the elevator company wasn't held uh, responsible for it. Uh, there were some other aspects to this fire. If you look at the elevator lobby, you can see the upholstered bench where the fire started. All of the foam burned off of it, but the wood remained, much like the Christmas tree. Right? The trunk remains, but the, the soft stuff burns off. And then the wall covering material was actually a very interesting wall covering. That's really the focus of this. The, the elevator lobby, this is about 30 feet, about 8 feet, about 7 or 8 feet wide. The entire elevator lobby was basically burned out. And then you can kind of see how, how the slope of the burning progressed down the corridor. So this fire burned out, I believe, for lack of oxygen. It may have just been due to fuel depletion or some combination. But interestingly enough, this fire had basically burned out before these people came down, and they were not confronted by hot conditions. They were confronted by very smoky conditions. And, uh, you know, I've, I've given this presentation before, and I've always managed to get my sample of wall covering back, so we'll see if I have good luck today. Uh, this is an interesting product. It's what's called an expanded vinyl foam wall covering. And this is the first case where I became aware of it. Uh, since then, the Life Safety Code has become aware of it. They actually regulate this product much like a textile wall covering. But what I want you to appreciate is uh, this product does have a Class A rating, but it also goes to flash over, and it is vinyl. So the products of combustion that it produces are basically hydrogen chloride. Alright, so again, when I analyze this fire, here's what the upholster chair looks, or the upholster bench looks like when it's burning. It looks a little bit like a Christmas tree, doesn't it? It's got this nice shape to it, nice conical shape to it. Right? Doesn't that look like a Christmas tree? Yeah. I don't think that's what we meant by that. Uh, what I do want you to know, if you go to the literature, if you go to the SFP handbook, you'll actually find data on Christmas trees. And so I, I realize you can't distinguish these, but kind of these smooth lines are Christmas trees. And these benches were burned twice. In one case, newspaper was put under the bench, and that basically ignited the bottom, and then it wrapped around and ignited the top. And so we got this heat release rate that went up to about uh, 800 kilowatts and came back down and then the second time it was ignited on the top and that fire developed a little bit more slowly but what I want you to appreciate is if you're if we are willing to say that a crisp, these types of Christmas trees are unacceptable then clearly this bench burns similarly and in some cases worse and you could put that into the same category and that's the kind of argument that that gets used uh, sometimes with respect to the wall covering, what's interesting is those of you on this side of the room have felt this. If you actually look at this microscopically, you can see the cellular structure of it. Right? So this, in fact, is a foam plastic product. And the Life Safety Code has had provisions since 1976 that says cellular or foam plastic material shall not be used as interior wall and ceiling finish. Now, there is an exception that says if you test it in a room type of configuration, 
you can qualify it on that basis. But, I mean, I certainly wouldn't have recognized this as a foam plastic. What happened is one of my colleagues, Professor Williamson at Berkeley, was looking through some of the product literature, and he noticed that one of the components of this was a blowing agent. So, well, the only reason we use a blowing agent is to make a foam plastic. And, and when we started to look at this microscopically, uh, we became aware of that. Now, this product was involved, some of you might remember, an Atlanta office building fire, where they had a fire in a corridor. This was the product that was involved in that, or a similar product. Um, I give the manufacturer of this product credit, because he went out and sought the advice of fire protection engineers and said, do I have a really serious problem here? And they said, yes, you do. And in fact, they went about getting changes to the life safety code that specifically address these expanded vinyl wall carpeting um, products. Basically, they have to be used in sprinkler buildings. Um, we've seen a more recent case of foam plastic interior finish. Uh, again, I'm not going to go into this in any great detail. We're all aware of this. Uh, I think most of us have seen the videotapes, saw how quickly the station fire developed. The only thing I'll say, and this is preliminary, I don't know it as a matter of fact, but uh, you know, here's the stage area, here's the drummer's alcove, these three jets here are intended to represent the pyrotechnics that were set off. And basically this wall, this alcove, this wall, and this wall were lined with flexible polyurethane foam. Not too much different from the foam that I showed you in the Mobile, Alabama fire test. Right? It's a non-fire retardant foam. When you start applying this stuff to the walls and ceiling, it's, uh, it's a disaster waiting to happen. Right? So there's a lot of outstanding issues there. Uh, you know, and if you look at the two photos on the left, the difference in time between the top photo and the bottom photo is only a matter of a minute or so. And that's how fast that fire developed. Uh, it was unfortunate, I think all of us have watched the videotape, the fact that these people didn't evacuate right away. I mean, a lot of them apparently thought it was part of the show. And you can clearly see that people were not starting to move right away, even though they're standing there looking at the fire. And so, you know, we all need to we all need to take a look at this and say, you know, what can we do uh, to avoid this? It seems to come up every so often. Uh, how am I doing for time? Coming up on an hour. Is it? Okay. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to bypass this next one. There's a lot of the same issues involved. It's one of Robert's favorites. Who's the son of a bitch Robert actually participated in this. This is a fire in San Francisco back in December of 1983. Uh, it, you see all those stacking chairs in the left photo. That was the primary fuel involved in that. Uh, there, was, there were a couple of issues. One of the issues, quite frankly, you see those three doorways. Well, I'll talk a little bit about it. I only, I only come here once in a while, right? Basically what we're looking at is, is this meeting room, the El Dorado room, which is on the second floor of the Cathedral Hill. If any of you have been to San Francisco, it's the old Jack Tar Hotel. Um, Cathedral Hill sounds better, right? Uh, but basically this corner is where those stacking chairs were. And we have a 40 foot wide by 100 foot long by 9 foot tall space. 7.30 on a Sunday morning, You've actually got a bunch of people standing right here because they're supposed to attend a real estate class in one of these meeting rooms, and they're looking down on the driveway waiting for the instructor to show up who's a little bit late. And so you've got a fire developing right next to them. This, this room has heat detectors in it. There's three heat detectors right down the center line. Heat detector goes off sends a signal down to the front desk, which is one floor below, right in front of these elevators. The manager figures out what zone is in alarm. He runs up these stairs, and when he gets to the top of the stairs, these doors are blowing open. The fire is blowing through these three doors and very quickly spread down through this lobby area, trapping a gentleman in the men's room and trapping a pregnant lady in a, at a phone bank, it moves so quickly. Um, so issues 
issues are, why is this heat detection system only providing enough notification to let you know you've got serious trouble? You know, what are the, what are the factors contributing to this fire? Why did it develop the way it did? The other one that we didn't focus on too much is, you know, this, this is basically an exit way. This is an occupied room. You know, this really should have been fire-resistant construction, and those doors didn't latch closed. If they had latch closed, then the fire wouldn't have vented through there. We might have had similar damage, but we wouldn't have had the same, um, we certainly wouldn't have had the deaths, right? The fire would have vented out the windows and, and other things. So, um, you know, there was a number of issues there. Coincidentally, and actually, unfortunately, we didn't recognize that this particular product was uh, actually lined the walls behind the, the chairs, and we're not quite sure what its contribution uh, might have been to that. Uh, so if there aren't any other questions, let me kind of run through. The one I really want to get to is the MGM Grand. And uh, again, this is going back um, to 1980, November of 1980, uh, 85 people died. Right? And that was tremendous. This, this was, to my, in my recollection, really the first large life loss fire in a modern building. And I think uh, it got everybody in the fire protection industry's attention at the time. It was really very dramatic, produced a lot of smoke. 68 of the 85 people died above the 13th floor. And this picture, I think, really shows how there's a lot more smoke up high and it, you know, there's 26 floors, so most of the people died above the midpoint of the building due to stack effect. That's where the smoke was coming back out of the shafts. A lot of deficient construction that allowed the smoke to rise up through the building. This is actually supposed to be a smoke-proof tower. You can see all the smoke coming out. The exit ways were clearly compromised early. People got trapped in their rooms. They couldn't escape. I want to focus on a couple of aspects of this. This is a ground floor of, this is about a quarter of the building on the ground floor. All right, you have the casino and registration area here. This is about the size of a football field. This is about 100 yards by about 50, 55 yards. You come over here, this is the deli restaurant where the fire started. You have the Orleans coffee shop just north of there. You have Barry Moore's and a couple of other restaurants just south of there. The fire started right here by this column in a side station in the deli at about 7 o'clock. By about 7.10, the side station flashed over. By about 7.15, the deli flashed over. And by about 7.25, flames were out the west entrance. The other thing I want you to appreciate is you can see all of these closely spaced columns here. This was the, would be the west wing, this would be the south wing, that would be the east wing. The people who died were largely concentrated in this area on the upper floors. Nobody died in the east wing, I don't think, I think there were people that died in a stairway in the south wing. Most of the people were here in the west wing. In all of these elevator shafts, there were seismic joints, there was a lot of ways for smoke to spread from the casino level up to the upper levels and also to block the exit paths. People just couldn't get out of their rooms and escape the fire uh, unless they were in the east wing because the fire wasn't down there. Um, from a sprinkler standpoint, there was a trade-off granted. The trade-off was the ground floor and the floor below this, which was public areas, would be sprinkler, except they didn't need the sprinkler areas that were occupied 24 hours a day. When the restaurant, when the hotel opened, the casino was occupied 24 hours a day, the registration area, the Orleans coffee shop and the deli were open 24 hours a day. Barry Moore's Cafe GG, all these other areas, these showrooms, there's a whole other part of the building, the ballrooms and all that are down here. All of that was sprinkled because it wasn't occupied 24 hours a day. Well, as fate would have it, as frequently happens in these cases, about five years after this place opened, they closed the deli during late night, early morning hours. 
right? The Orleans coffee shop stayed open 24 hours. The deli didn't, and nobody picked up on that administrative change, that operational change. Nobody imposed the administrative rules that would require that build that space to come back and be sprinkled. And of course, it's always the case in these big fights. You can always look at these circumstances and say, well, gee, what if, what if, what if? And the fact is, we have these major fires once in a while. Because all of these factors line up just right, and you have this serious fire. So I do want you to appreciate that that was an important aspect of this. And if you look at any risk management model, the last step in your flow chart is monitor for change. Right? This, is, this, to me, is kind of the poster child for the failure. If you're going to use administrative controls for fire protection, you've got to pay attention to that and constantly monitor it. And that's really why you can think of sprinklers as a very robust solution, right? Because it really permits, you, you might have a, a lot of other minor mistakes that sprinklers can compensate for. Um, so I would certainly advocate that. Um, all right, the other thing I want to talk about is the details of how this fire started. And in this particular case, you can see the side station, right? I pointed out that column. Here's the deli restaurant. Here's that column I was pointing to. There was actually an enclosed side station. A little recognized factor is that up in the ceiling, they had a two-foot vent similar to these that basically exhausted air and smoke out of this space, took it up into the return air plant and distributed it through the air handling system. Uh, that was significant. Uh, I'll let you guys read this. I'm, I've actually skipped one uh, videotape. I want to move on to this MGM one. As part of the investigation of this, we actually uh, reconstructed this side station in large scale. So let me show you the video take of that. detail what the ceiling looked like uh, as we come back down you'll see uh, this is what's called the pie case you know, they had a bunch of pies in there for people in the restaurant now what we're going to do is go um, now we're looking inside the side station again we tried to reconstruct this you know to be fairly representative Here's the two-foot ceiling drill that I was talking about. We did put a supply vent into, but it wasn't, we didn't have any air being fed into it for this particular test. This is the back side of the pie case, which is uh, made out of plywood. And you can all see this, you know, very sophisticated place. It was all nice simulated wood grain contact paper that they used to, uh, to cover all this. <laughs> Uh, and again, we, we, to the, be, the best information we had available at the time, we tried to, to mock this up. Um, all right, so now what we're going to do is, uh, it's going to be a little, no, we're going to look at some more preview. Uh, eventually what we're going to do is the fire was started on the counter. We weren't trying to simulate the ignition, but we were trying to simulate the ignition location. <coughs> So we, we got the fire going in what was reportedly the area of, of uh, origin. It's basically going to be right up there on that counter. And sometimes you wish you had fast forward. Uh, but anyways, so the fire is kind of going to go up here and get up above here. And, and the point, I'll get a little bit ahead of myself, what I want you to appreciate is in essence, for those of you in the industrial world, we had what in essence turned out to be a draft curtain roof vent situation, such that all of the early smoke that was developed was trapped within the side station, 
and because of the ceiling vent, it didn't bank down to the doorway level and flow out into the next room. And again, when you look at what are the subtle differences between a footnote fire and a headline, I really think that that's the one piece that we can point to and say, if I take that ceiling vent out, then all the early smoke flows into the next room where it has a much higher probability of being discovered early in time for people to fight this fire. And so uh, what, I, what, what this videotape is going to show you, um, we're seeing a lot of reflection now. Once we start the fire, that'll change. And what we're going to do is kind of go back and forth here. We're looking in through the back side. Again, when we mock this up, we put this uh, window in for observation purposes. And then eventually we're going to flip over to a perspective through the doorway so we can see what's going on there. Right, so again, the fire allegedly was of electrical origin within this wall and broke through here and then uh, kind of developed up uh, along here. Uh, this clock, I think, was started about 43 seconds early, so you have to subtract about 40, 43 seconds to get the run time on this. Are there any questions while this is uh, running? Do you have any smoke detectors that LED them? Did they have? No, they didn't. You know, this was back in about 1980. They, they just weren't used on as widespread a basis as they, would, as they might be now. In fact, there were some deficiencies. I think that there were some missing smoke detectors in the ventilation system that, in fact, should have been there based on the size of the exhaust systems and that. Were yeah. smoke detectors um, here? I don't think so. What do you use for the ignition? Uh, well, we've got, a, we've got a wood crib sitting there. There's a little bit of excelsior around that. And then there was a, I think, about a half a liter of heptane used to get it going. And, uh, and, and that's burned off uh, at this point. All right, so let me uh, let this run through. It takes, it takes a few minutes. Realistic, I mean, it, we're, we're just coming up on two minutes into the fire. It takes about four minutes for this room to go to flashover, so things are going to start accelerating now. You had a question over here? How old was it built at the time? Uh, it, was, it was built in the early 1970s. Under the 1970 Uniform Building Code, which was the last version of the Uniform Code before the high-rise provisions came out. All right, again, now we're looking at this. You can see that fire developing. Relatively speaking, I spoke a minute too late. Relatively speaking, there's not much smoke coming out. Right? I want you to imagine if you take that ceiling vent out, all the smoke that's being produced by that fire has to come out through the doorway. But in essence, we have a roof vent there. It's a ceiling vent. And again, the other thing is they're actually drawing air through that, so there'd actually be a negative pressure that would promote flow into the space and out through the ceiling. But uh, the smoke layer, as you can see, I mean, it, it's like right there. And every so often you get a little hiccup in the fire and this thing starts to bank down. We're going to go back and look inside the room here in just a second. And I want you to appreciate what a ceiling fire we have going in there. I mean, when I look at this, I say that's a heck of a big fire to be burning without having much evidence of that showing up in the adjacent space. Now, I don't think we've recreated this thing perfectly, but I do think that it's a plausible explanation for how you could have a fire develop essentially to the point of flashover in an occupied building without being discovered. Anecdotally, there were reports of people saying, well, gee, I could smell smoke earlier than this, but they couldn't identify the source. And of course, when, when this smoke gets up into the return air plenum, this, this return air plenum is serving the whole casino. That stuff gets so diffused and distributed throughout the building, you don't know where it's coming from. Right? Now, obviously, the simple solution here is if you're going to have an unoccupied restaurant, <coughs> sprinkler. All right, so here we are about three minutes, uh, three and a half minutes into it. There was a cook who came out of the kitchen with a fire hose who looked at that and said, 
oh, the penal board's on fire. I better not use water on an electrical fire. All right, that's in the, that's in the NFPA report. All right, so what I want you to appreciate is about four to four and a half minutes into this fire, this is what I believe is fairly representative of what's coming out of that side station. The Delhi restaurant is 3,500 square feet. It's got about 100 upholstered chairs in it. It has upholstered benches. It has pictures on the wall that are covered with uh, plexiglass. It has carpet. It has combustible ceiling tiles. And you know, that's a heck of a fire. And I really think what, what happened now, this get, got, the, the Delhi got driven to flash over within about another three or four minutes. And then uh, that blew up through the doors into the casino and it fed on all the combustibles through the casino and raced through the casino. Um, but I really think that that ceiling vent, from a technical standpoint, I really think that that ceiling vent played a significant role in allowing this fire to go undetected. It basically developed a flashover without showing much evidence in the adjacent room. Um, they, they were almost there on the scene. By the time the fire blew out from the deli into the um, into the casino er, into the casino area, they were on the scene and they were starting to approach it, and they got driven out of there. So they they were just a couple minutes behind. Delayed fire department notification. I don't recall was an issue in the MGM Grand Fire. Yeah. But what, what was an issue was just the shift change oh. in that fire department, and they had a number of false alarms, and the original officer on the scene was not in full turnout gear and wasn't prepared for this based on their prior experience with the facility. That caused significant delays in their water application. All right, one of the things I've been doing, and I've done this a couple times with both zone models and field models, most recently, some of you may be familiar with, these F with the FPS model, which is uh, being developed at NIST. And what I'm trying to do is recreate this. And you can kind of see, I, I, I won't take the time to show this in any detail. But you know, quite honestly, I think it did a pretty good job of representing the ceiling fire. And the other thing, you can kind of see by the difference in colors, how this, the hot layer stays above the doorway here. And, and all of that smoke is able to exhaust up through this vent. Uh, what I really planned to do was I thought it was a good idea. I actually used the videotape to kind of calibrate the model so that I could tweak the material properties until I could simulate the results pretty accurately. And then I wanted to do a what-if analysis. And I simply took that vent out of that. And sure enough, what you see is all the smoke flows out and bathes the ceiling. I always say I'm not going to do this. I'm going to do it. Um, the uh, what I but one of the things I want to emphasize for those of you who, pay, who understand the details of the model is I thought, well, that's a great idea. I did it once before with CFAST, and it didn't work out so well. What actually happens when I take that ceiling vent out? What that does is it forces the smoke layer down further, and the fact that I have an elevated fire on this counter, what that does is it reduces the entrainment height. And so when I take the ceiling vent out, I get a fire that's completely different. It becomes underventilated. Now I don't know, I don't trust that. I would like verification, but I don't have the resources to run the same test again without the ceiling vent. But I really thought I was going to get basically the same fire, but it would vent out through the doorway. And so now that when the model tells me that in fact I shifted into an oxygen limited regime, you know, I don't know whether to trust it or not, and I'd like to get some experimental data to verify that. So let, let me uh, try to quickly show you that I've got these things actually running in the background uh, just to give you a sense of this. All right, so this would be, this is the case, and this thing is just kind of running and so again, what this is really simulating is it's trying to show you roughly where the smoke layer would be. You can see it's right up here by the top of the doorway. 
and you can see the fire starting to bathe the ceiling. The videotape kind of showed that same thing. I was really pretty satisfied with how this qualitatively uh, looked right. And again, what we can do is, uh, is kind of turn this around. And you can see now the, the smoke is just starting to come out. Right? And we're about three minutes into that. If you look down at the bottom, we're about 190 seconds. Let me just kind of let that run its course. So here we are shortly before flashover. Remember when we went back, we had the, there was smoke under the ceiling when we turned this back around again. I really think that it does a, a pretty good job of representing uh, what happened. And we're just about to go to flashover. You can see the flames now. And you can see how quickly this thing escalates, similar to what we saw in the videotape. It would actually look more dramatic if I took the smoke out of there. They're basically at the same location. All right, and then it goes back to the start. Uh, again, the point I was making is if I look at if I look at the case without the vent. Again, this is just kind of running along here. Even though it looks similar, the burning rate is dramatically decreased. But here we are 80 seconds into it, and you can see how much smoke is out here bathing the ceiling. And again, my thesis on this is really that, but for the presence of that vent, somebody would have seen this smoke. There was people in the kitchen, there was people kind of passing near this area, and uh, you can kind of see this difference. Are there any questions on this? Did you say that there were or were not any duct smoke detectors in that return or duct smoke? I was feeding on them. You know, I, that's an issue I haven't addressed. I don't know if the property you remember. I don't think there were any up in that. It, just, yeah. it was the eye in the sky that was also. Oh, yeah, right. I'm sorry. In, in the return air plenum, I don't believe there were any. Yeah. I know in the tower there was some issue whether they had the required smoke detectors to shut the system down uh, upon smoke detection in the tower ventilation. That's what I thought you were asking about. So you're in favor of the theory that if the air handlers had shut on and there was no air movement in the building, that that would have resulted in a, uh, a, a better life safety issue than for the building afterwards? No. I, don't, I don't think it would make much difference. There were too many other pathways. You know, but one of the things in both this building as well as in the Las Vegas Hilton is the room air was actually being drawn out of the corridors in direct violation of NFPA 98. And I think that made a made difference. People within the rooms couldn't keep the smoke from coming in. That was a problem. Again, we're breaking off the uh, the domestic drains from the sinks, trying to breathe in the stack, among other things. Okay. I have one more. You know, I, I can end here. I do have one more case study, which is more of a systems type of case study. Want me to go on or stop? <laughs> All right. this, in this case, there was a refrigerated warehouse. This was actually a case that was tried just recently in Omaha. Um, basically, a cold storage warehouse for most of the building. A portion of the building had been converted to a food processing facility. Um, the food processing part required nightly <coughs> wash down with hot water. And the building was protected by a combined pre-action dry pipe system. Um, it was fairly common for the washdown operations to activate the heat detectors, which would open the pre-action valve. Uh, the building engineers would sometimes shut down the system instead of resetting it promptly. And the systems were being monitored for central station service. Every time the pre-action valve activated, an alarm signal would be transmitted to the central station. It would be a supervisory signal. No, no, it's water flow. It's water flow, Robert. It's water flow. Sorry. <laughs> you, can, you can tell who I was representing. The, the central station <laughs> operator. <laughs> the central station operator, represented by a certain unnamed person in the room. Who did? Alleged, wrongfully. That, uh, that this was actually just a supervisor signal transmission. But, but what's interesting, some of you in the, in the detection and alarm industry, uh, you may have, you may have uh, clients or maybe you're, yourself in this situation. 
if you're offering central station services, you have to comply with the UL requirements and the NFPA 72 requirements for central station services. And that says you have to directly retransmit alarm signals to the fire department. And in this case, they were basically calling up the facility. They had gotten into the habit, I don't remember the exact history, but they had basically gotten into the habit of simply calling up the facility and saying, hey, I've got a pre-action trip, and let it go with that. And then unfortunately, in this case, this thing was left, you know, it's near the holidays. This thing was shut down. It was left off. The fire happened. The sprinkler system was out of operation. And so the central station uh, provider settled. And But what, what was interesting is the owner of the facility and the manager of the facility were also sued for shutting the system down. And what was interesting about this is contractually, the tenant had to establish gross negligence against the manager. And the fact that these people were repeatedly shutting the system down and leaving it shut down the jury actually came back with a gross negligence uh, verdict, which is, that's a pretty high level, right? That's above ordinary negligence. This is not just saying that you're doing something wrong, you're doing something wrong and willfully uh, doing something wrong. So it, it was a big deal. You know, basically the way this was set up, and I don't think this is really a recommended system, but they did have this one deluge valve that was serving four separate dry pipe systems. And so the, um, the when the heat detectors, when they had 135 degree rated heat detectors in here, and there, there was also paper in there saying, look, just change out the heat detectors, right? When you're using 145 degree water to clean a space with 135 degree heat detectors, right? It's not hard to figure out what's going to happen. And it happened time and time again. And they could have simply replaced the heat detectors with 195 degree units, 205, whatever it is, and been done with it, right? But they didn't. So on a fairly, it wasn't nightly, but on a very regular basis. And of course, you know what happens. You blame the stupid cleaning crew for setting off the detectors all the time, right? And you come and yell at them and you shut down the system and say, well, the engineer in the morning will take care of it. You know, the engineer in the morning forgets about it tomorrow and the next day and the next day. And so what they would, the other thing though, is that they could have, you might not recognize the difference, but basically once the deluge valve operates, they could have continued to operate, right? They could have continued to operate just as standard dry pipe systems. Now, in refrigerated warehouse, some of you know better than I do, operators get nervous. If they've got a freezer, you know, if they're just one trip away from freezing up all their pipe, they get nervous. And that's the whole reason for having the interlock of the deluge valve in there. <clears throat> but in fact, what would happen is you would get water flow out through the alarm system as a result of the deluge valve trip, and they would shut down the main control valve protecting all five of these systems, controlling all five of these systems, when all they had to do was shut down a 90 degree valve to stop the water flow from the alarm. They could have continued to operate as a standard dry pipe system, but instead they shut the entire system down, forgot to turn it back on, and had a fire that burned up the facility uh, as a result of it. So, so that's uh, kind of that one. All right, so to wrap this up, uh, you know, I'm preaching to the choir here, right? It does take specialized expertise to analyze the dynamics of building fires. Um, I think that it really takes this expertise within the context of the performance expected of code standards and regulations. If you're really going to assess when a failure occurs, because if you don't know what the expected performance is, you can't really define whether performance is acceptable or not. Um, Fire cause and origin investigators, many of them lack the education and experience with regulations to understand these performance issues. And similarly, the fire scientists frequently don't understand that context either, as I said. So right, here we are reaching the fire. We should all be involved in all these investigations and expand our business. So 
with that, I will conclude. Uh, thanks for very much. Uh, just to finish up here, uh, this is uh, the last.